Those of you that were here, that's me. Um, what do we talk about? Uh, the angel and the angel. Yes. The angel, right, what's the kind of we've been talking about? The and the, and we said that the could be or is possibly the manifestation of whom? Jesus. Jesus, right? So that brings us to another question, or, or the question that, that I've asked is, then where is Jesus in the Old Testament? Is there evidence of him being active, or is there something that we it can point us to, to, to the Old Testament where we can see Jesus in action, um, other than if we accept, right, that the angel of the Lord is Jesus, right, which I think many agree, um, that this is just a manifestation of Jesus in the Old Testament, but is there other places where we can see Jesus in the Old Testament? All right, now we're going to go through a lot of references in which point to the Old, to, in the Old Testament that point to Jesus or kind of describe Jesus or describe kind of stuff that you guys already know, which will probably make more sense. So um, let's start in Genesis 3.15. Let's, let's all go there. Let's start at 14, 314. Let's start there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. What does it say? Somebody want to read it? Do I need to pick? Then the Lord said to the servant, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Okay, what's, uh, who's God talking to? The serpent. What's going on? What just happened? What just happened before he this? He cursed it. What's that? He cursed it. Why is he cursing it? Deceived Eve. Because he deceived Eve. Okay, keep reading. To so what? Fifteen. And that will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and your and her offspring. He will strike your head and he will strike his heel. Okay, so it's talking to the serpent, right? And whose offspring does God refer to? Whose offspring? Fifteen. Who's who's whose offspring? It is mankind, but who who specifically? Adam. And what is his name? What does he say? He, and, her offspring. and her. And okay. And so his and her offspring, which is whom? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Okay. So Adam and Eve. <laughs> Their offspring will do what? What's he going to do? He will cause hostility between them. Keep going. He will strike your head and you will strike Okay, he will head. strike whose head? Her head. No. Nope. His head. Whose head? head? No, no, no. The, the serpent's, serpent's head. head. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. Okay, whose offspring? Adam. Adam. Adam and Eve. And what is the offspring going to do? Strike his the Strike the head of whom? The serpent's head. What does this striking the head of a serpent mean? What does that mean? What, what, do, you, what do you guys think it means? Someone, what do you think that means? <laughs> if I take a bat to your head, what, what is most likely? I'm going, to, I'm going to kill it, okay? I'm going to kill it. So who is the one or whom can we assume is going to strike the head of the serpent. The offspring of the woman. Only the offspring of the woman. Right? I'm going to try this again. Because you guys look either you're asleep or confused. Okay? So, whose offspring? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve is going to do what? Kill the serpent. Kill the serpent, right? And so, who is, who is also in theory or... Uh, what's the word? Or, um... I forget what the word is. Um, who else can we consider, or does the Bible consider the son of the offspring of Eve in, in the lineage? Who ultimately is in Eve's lineage that is important? Jesus. Jesus, yes, very good. Because that's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus, okay? So everything is Jesus today. So 
<laughs> Just throw out Jesus and you probably get it right, okay? So, if the offspring of Adam and Eve is Jesus, it is could be referring that it is Jesus who will strike the head of the serpent and kill the serpent. Does that make sense? Because, I mean, ultimately, what happens in the end? He kills the serpent. Okay, Jesus kills the serpent. What is the representation of the serpent? Who is the serpent? Satan, okay? So, Jesus defeats, okay? Defeats the serpent or kills the serpent, if you like. Okay, so this is kind of like a foreshadow or it points to or, or it looks at Jesus in this sense. Does that make sense? So we see Jesus or a representation of Jesus or something that looks like Jesus or a reference to Jesus since the beginning in Genesis. Let's look at another one. Genesis 22, chapter 22, verse 8. <coughs> you can probably turn that heater off now. Let's start at um, 6. Who wants to read? Other than this. Other than this. Go ahead, Juan Carlos. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. Who is himself? Abraham. Okay, keep going. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are No, here. hold on. Read six again. Uh, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac. And, okay. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. Okay. What is Isaac carrying? Fire and knife. Oh. What is he carrying? The fire and the knife. No, the wood. Can't carry fire, buddy. <laughs> What's he carrying? One. The wood. The wood. Okay. So he's carrying the wood. Isaac's carrying the wood. What's um Abraham carrying? The knife. The knife. Okay, good. Alright, read it again and keep going. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Alright. Here. Look, this is just Okay, who is Abraham to the Jews? The to father. Father of what? Father, right? Okay. What did the father do in this, in verse six? What does he do in verse six? Places the wood on his son. He places the wood on who? On, his son. on Isaac. On who? Isaac. The son. The father Abraham, father places the wood on Isaac. Do we see some representation here? Yeah. Okay. Keep reading. As, yeah, as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? All right, what does Isaac realize? What does he realize? There's no offering. There's no offering, right? He's like, you're making me carry this wood, you got the knife. Where's the lamb at, right? Okay, what does he respond? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Look, why does the Bible say God himself shall provide a sacrifice? And why doesn't it say God will provide a sacrifice? Notice that. Why does he just say, why does the verse 8 just say God will provide a sacrifice? Instead it says God will provide what? himself a sacrifice why you have the NIV don't you yeah it's not going to come from us it's interesting right because in a sense yes we've been talking about Jesus in John 1.1 1, 1. and John 1.1 1, 1 says what Elmer and the word and the word was God. was God. So we concluded that it might look something like this. 
So when Abraham, when Isaac says, God, or Abraham responds, God will provide himself a sacrifice, what is he talking about? Could it be that he's talking about, he's making a foreshadow, a reference to this. The father Abraham places the wood on Isaac. <coughs> the father in this says, places what on Jesus? Cross. Cross. Do you see that? You can see it from the beginning. You can see a reference to Jesus. You can see that most things point to Jesus. You can see that Jesus has been talked about or foreshadowed or, or, or there's a direction or a hint of him since the beginning, even the stuff that we think have nothing to do with him. Abraham says God will provide himself a sacrifice. Could it be that God will provide himself a sacrifice <coughs> or God will provide himself as a sacrifice? Make sense? I mean, kind of. We see it? Yeah? Wait, and 8, I think that was it for 8, right? It just says for verse 8? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then in 9, when they reached a place, God had told them, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood, and he found his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. He reached out his hand, took the knife and to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called out from him, from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied, 12, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Don't do anything to him. I know that you fear God. Yeah, that would have held me, him from your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his thorns. Okay, so it's a foreshadow. God did provide a sacrifice in that moment. Physically, yes. Could it be talking about this? Absolutely. It's pointing to Jesus since the beginning. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Let's start at 13. Uh, Kimmy. And uh, hold on. Um, Liz, can you read when Kimmy's done? Here, hold on. No, that's fine. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. What were you together? So 313? 313 and 14. Moses said to God, I am going to the children of Israel. <coughs> I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. When they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Okay. Moses says, They're going to ask me, In whose name do I come? Or they're going to ask me, under whose authority or who is asking you to be here? That's what he tells God. And God says what? Tell them what? I am who I am. I am who I am. Does this make sense? Yes. Do you think Moses was completely convinced by this answer? God, when they tell me, when they ask me who sent me, uh, what do I say? And God says, tell them I am who I am sent you. I mean, really? What, what is he, what, what, I wonder what he thought after that, what he was thinking. So I'm just going to tell him I am who I am. Now imagine him in front of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh goes, who sent you? And he goes, I am who I am sent me. <laughs> what the heck? But that's what that's that was his name. And let's 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 go to John eight fifty seven. Look at this. Uh, let's start at 54. Um, Elmer.
He is our God, but you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like him. I do know him. And I keep him Jesus is saying he knows who? Who does he know? The Father. The Father. He knows God. Right? Keep going. Your father Abraham rejoiced that you would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and, you, and have you seen Abraham? So look at that. They're like, Jesus says, Abraham was excited to see me. Abraham was excited to see the day that I will make myself present. And he goes, dude, you're like 15, right? You're not even 50, I'm sorry. He says, you're not even 50. You know how long ago Abraham lived? Like, what are you talking about, right? And look at what he says, 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. He didn't say, before Abraham existed, I existed. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus didn't use, a, like, a formal language to, like, make sense where he says, yeah, before Abraham, I had already existed. I, I, he says, before Abraham, I am. Which doesn't make sense either. Like, li literally, like, in, in, the, in the languages, be before, before Abraham, I am. And like, what does that mean? What are you referring to? Well, Jesus is saying I am, and God so, said I am. So if Jesus is saying I am, and God said I am, then it points to this. So since the beginning, in Exodus, when he is before Pharaoh, when God is talking to Moses, and Moses says, who sent you? He sent me. Go ahead. I think if you would have said before Abraham was, I existed, it would have contradicted himself because if he was eternal, he can't say he was or he will be. He just is. He just simply is. And that's what I am is. Mm -hmm. It just always is. Mm -hmm. so, and that's the beautiful part yeah. about I am. Mm -hmm. Because if we look at John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. It's saying that he had already existed and he continues to exist. So before, so it's one of those things where at creation, right, in Genesis 1-1, one, one, I asked this, what was also, what was created in Genesis 1-1 one, one other than the obvious? What was something else that was created? Are you talking about sin? Okay, sin is one. Good. And, and, right? In, in a sense, right? In a sense. Time. The light. Time. So, time did not exist pre-Jesus Christ and God. There was no such thing as time. So time began to exist here. When he created the earth, uh, he started with the moon and the sun and, and the rotations. Time began. So when he says, I am, it's he says, I am, because if it was under the constriction of time, you'd have to say, I was, I am, and I will be. But Jesus said, Jesus said, or God says, I am, I just exist. I'm just always there. So that's why this is very important. And you're right. You're absolutely right. That's why Genesis 1 1 is, I'm sorry, John 1 1 is important because he says, uh, in the beginning was the word. Not this beginning, and whatever beginning it is, I existed. Before time existed, I am. I already was. I was already there. That's the beauty of this. Of That's why this makes sense. I am, but then Jesus takes it a little more literal. Uh, Kimmy, read John 10, 9. Jesse, read John 8, 12. Liz, read John 10, 11. Juan Carlos, read John 11, 25 to 26. <clears throat> David, uh, John 14, 6. And uh, uh, David Hernandez, John 15, 15. Want to read? Yeah, whoever has it, read it. Yeah, whoever has it, read John 15, 15 says, uh, No longer do I call you servant, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call 
I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I made you I made known to you. Someone else? I didn't give you the wrong one. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No hey, I am what? The way, the truth, and the I'm life. The way, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. life. Someone else? Life. Life. I knew that. <laughs> I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd sacrifice. I am the good shepherd. Who else? Good. good. I, I am the light of the world. I am light again. No, now it's light. I am the resurrection and the life. And life again. Who else? I am the door. I am the door. Anyone else? Is that it? Dave, I gave you the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So now it's it, it, Jesus takes it a little further so you really understand who he is. Not just I am in this sense, I existed since the beginning of time, I am who I am, but I am the door, I am the way, the way, I am the life, I am the truth, I am the good shepherd, I am the door, I am the light. He is, always has been, and always will continue to be. I think there's one more, I am the true light. Yes, door, I mean there's, there's a lot, right? I mean there's just, does it make sense? He's a double wide, yeah. <laughs> okay. Since the beginning, it's always pointed to Jesus. It's always pointed to Jesus. Um, <laughs> Exodus 28 1. Exodus 28 1. Somebody want to read? Uh, then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's son. Just uh, one. Yeah, not that. Okay, Aaron and Aaron's son, Nab, Nab and Ab yeah, names. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Go to Leviticus chapter 4. There we go. Leviticus chapter 4. Okay, so he calls Aaron and he wants Aaron to be what? The priest. Now, what does 4 3 say? Is that where we're at? Yeah. What does it say? If the high priest sins, bringing guilt upon the entire community. Oh, actually, start started started to. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. This is how you are to deal with those those who sin unintentionally by doing what by doing anything that violates one of the Lord's commands. If the high priest sins, bringing guilt upon the entire community, he must give a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He must present to the Lord a young bull with no defects. Keep going? Yep. He must bring the bull to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle, lay his hand on the bull's head, and slaughter it. Okay, so what's he going to do? Bring the bull and kill it. Okay. Sacrifice. Why is he going to do it? An offering. An offering for what? Sin. For sin. Okay? So there's an offering for sin that has to be made. All right? That has to be made for for by the priest. So the, the line of Aaron, okay, for the sin... And what did this do? What did it do? The atonement. The atonement. Good, good word, Jesse. Okay? <laughs> the atonement. Sounds like you've been there on Wednesdays. Okay. So now let's go to um, <laughs> Leviticus 21. Twenty-one sixteen. All the way to 24, Elmer. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, 
None of your offspring throughout either generations has, who has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near, a man blind or lame, or anyone who has mu mutilated, who has a mutilated face, or a limb too long, or a man who has an injured foot or an injured hand, or a hunchback or dwarf, or a man with a defect in his sight, or an ancient disease or scabs or crushed testicles. No man of the offspring of Aaron, uh, the priest who has a blemish, shall come near to, to the offer to offer the Lord's food offering. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat <coughs> the bread of his God, both of the most holy and the holy uh, things. But he shall not go through the wheel or approach the altar because he has a blemish that he may not obtain <coughs> my sanctuaries. For I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So Moses spoke to Aaron and to his sons. Okay, so the priest. How, how, um, what did they, what was their condition? It, it, it's like it almost kind of hard to say because I mean, the idea is that they're without blemish. You can't be a dwarf. You can't be this. You can't you be lame. You know, I mean, there can be nothing wrong with you. You have to be, in a sense, you have to be without blemish. And don't you dare enter into to offer sacrifice because the priest has to be this very exact person. And if anything were to not be as stated, what would happen to the high priest? He would die in the very presence of God, right? This is what would happen in the temple, right? This is what you call, this is the inside, this is the church, okay? This is, let's pretend this is where we play, okay? And this is where the congregation is. This is called the high, the holy, the holy. The holy of holies, right? The holy of holies, and this is just called the holy place, right? The priests were allowed to enter here if they fell under these conditions only. If they did not, the very presence of God would actually kill them and they would die because they were not this. They were not perfect. So that's a problem because if they weren't perfect and they would die, then they can't offer the atonement for the people and for themselves for the forgiveness of their sins. Right? This is what it's asking of them. Now look, let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, start at 14. Third, 12, 12. Let's start at 12. 11, 11, 11. <laughs> start at 9, 11. Start at 9, 11. Kimmy, 9, 11. But Christ, when he came as a high priest of the good things to come, by greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. So Jesus came as what? The high priest. As the high priest. Okay, keep going. Neither by the blood of goats and cows. <coughs> but by his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified so that the fresh flesh is purified how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God Okay, so what happens now? Jesus becomes what? The high, the high priest. It's no longer Aaron. It's Jesus. Does he meet these requirements? Yes. Absolutely. But now doesn't he just doesn't come in here occasionally once a year. He lives here. Jesus now lives here. He is in the holies of holies. He is the forgiveness of sins. He, he is your representation. He is your priest. He, he covers your sins. He is your atonement. And he now lives here. That's why the veil was torn when he died. That's why this no longer exists. Because he is your atonement. He is the perfect sacrifice. And he now lives here. 
um, Hebrews 6.20, just to reinforce the point. Jesse. When Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, <clears throat> having become a high priest for how long? Forever. Forever. After the order of Melchizedek. Yeah, Melchizedek. <laughs> it all points to Jesus. Since the beginning. Since Genesis, and Exodus, um, Leviticus. It, it's all Christ centered. It's all pointing to one thing, Jesus. Isaiah talks about the prophecy, about the birth and the death. Jeremiah talks about the suffering, Joel, of the hopes of his people, that he is the hope of his people. Amos talks that he will be the judge of all nations. Zephaniah, he is the king of Israel. Malachi says he is the son of righteousness. Exodus chapter 12. We don't have to go there because you guys know the story, I hope. Okay. <sighs> Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 12, God gives a command to Moses, and he says, I need you to do something. Okay, I need you to take a lamb, I need you to kill it, and what? I need you to do something with its blood. What was it? Sprinkle, it on, the sprinkle it on the doorstep. So I want you to take a lamb, and I want you to take the blood and sprinkle it here. Okay? And whoever is inside, whoever is in this door, it says... And this is, I love when people say the angel of death. No such thing. There's no such thing. God says, I will come down and I will kill every firstborn. But if there's blood on the posts, I will ignore that home and I will keep going and you are safe. They are saved by what? The blood of the lamb. Who is the perfect lamb? Who is the perfect sacrifice? Jesus. Jesus. So God himself says, I'm going to come down and I'm going to kill every firstborn. But if you sacrifice a lamb, if you sacrifice it and you sprinkle it, if you sprinkle it around your door, I will come down. I will look at it and I will know that this house is saved. It's redeemed. It's atoned by the blood of the lamb and I will continue on my way. <sighs> Sound familiar? It's the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus. It all points to Jesus. How long was Jonah in the belly of the fish of the whale? Three days and three nights. And how long was Jesus dead for? Three days and three nights. How long was Israel in the desert? Forty years. How long was Jesus fasting for and got taken to the desert? Forty days. Forty, right? But they were both taken to the desert. They were tried. Israel unfortunately failed. Did Jesus? No. no. I mean, it, it all points. It, it all points to the same thing. But Jesus has always existed. It's always been about Jesus. It's always going to be about Jesus. And it's been Him since the very beginning. Not the beginning of creation, but He was there. But since the beginning of time. In that form. <clears throat> Just to close out, um, Liz, Hebrews 13, 8, uh, Kimmy, Romans eleven thirty six, and Juan Carlos, Colossians 1, 15 to 16. Hebrews 13, 8, Romans eleven thirty six, and Colossians 1, 15 to 16. Uh, for from him and through him and to him for all things to him be the glory forever amen all things all things and Colossians so the son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation for in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him Everything is created through him, for him, because of him, whatever you want to say. Jesus has been the same, will always be the same. Jesus is God. Questions? 
comments? Okay. Good. Let's pray. God, we thank you as, as we come to your word, as we come to listen, God, as, 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 we, as you reveal to us, Father, more and more about your son, about Jesus. God, we thank you as we see, Father, for ourselves that it is about Jesus, that he's always existed, he's always been, he's always been active. And we ask that he continues to be active in our lives, God, that you continue to, to dwell in us, to open our minds, God, to expand our horizons. That we may see, God. That we may be converted, changed, God. That we may be completely regenerated, Father, by the things that we learn. That we learn to love you more. May we learn, God, more about your grace, Father, and how it's undeserving. How Jesus came to give us grace, as he's always existed. That Jesus is God. 